Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday, or for channel members, Sunday, show where we recap all the best spaceflight and space news events that took place last week, preview all the best launches and events scheduled for this week, and then delve into the pages of spaceflight history and cover all the most interesting space anniversaries due to take place over the next seven days. If all this sounds good, then make sure you're subscribed. These videos, being news, are best enjoyed on their publication date and subscribing and ringing the bell helps ensure that you get them on time. Anyway, in our first segment, I go over all the latest and greatest updates pertaining to SpaceX's Starship development, so uh, let, let's, let's do that now, let's do that. Starship SN15 remains on suborbital pad B following its successful flight from suborbital pad A on the 5th of May. Soon after the vehicle made its legendary flight and landing, we had a tease from Elon Musk that a second flight was a possibility. However, at the time of me writing this script, we've not had any further elaboration or information regarding SN15's future. I would imagine a thorough examination of the vessel and its three Raptor engines is still underway, with particular emphasis on the engine that supposedly had an early shutdown on ascent during the flight. The Raptor engines seem visually okay, based on my experience of not knowing anything about what rocket engines should look like, mind you, but further reason to believe that one of them may be a little bit sus is because of the fact that the SN15 only lit two of the engines for its flip and landing, rather than relighting all three at first. It's worth noting though that this doesn't necessarily mean that there was anything wrong, it could just be that internally the plans were changed from an initial triple engine relight for the shutdown of one. In a Reddit AMA last week, Starship software development lead Asha Dunn confirmed that Starship is designed to choose in real time which engines are best suited to execute the flip and landing burn, and with each successive flight from SN8 through to 15, the software has been made to be smarter and smarter at detecting potential engine problems and compensating for this by selecting a different engine for the manoeuvre. So there may well have not been anything wrong with the unlit engine, but it would have made sense to use it over this one here that actually did light up, as this setup would have offered a better lever arm force to perform the flip, as using these two back engines, as in the back of this particular shot, uh, will push the Starship vertically a little bit more easily than the two that lit. So one would assume that something in the software deemed this engine to be unreliable. Again, all speculation, and it'll be interesting to see what happens if SpaceX attempts a triple static fire test, and if one of the engines needs to be swapped, and if that engine that needs to be replaced is the one that didn't light for landing. I'm still hoping for a reflight of SN15. I know Elon made similar claims that SN5 and 6 would be reflown, which of course never happened, but given the fact that SN15 is basically the full starship, sans the three vacuum raptors and a few other bits of superstructure, reflying it would make a lot more sense for SpaceX over reflying SN5 and 6 in order to help validate the rapid reusability of the starship vehicle that they're striving for. Should SN15 fly again, it does leave the question as to what SpaceX will do with SN15. 16, which is still sitting in the high bay. Current thoughts are that if SN16 isn't scrapped and is used to perform a test flight, then this will be to the full 20km high altitude flight target. Speaking of scrapping prototypes, we've been watching the progress of the three in-construction super heavy vehicles, BN2, BN2.1 and BN3. Initially, BN2 was supposed to be the first full-scale super heavy, which would be used to perform test hops and would potentially have been orbit capable, according to Elon on Twitter. Since then, however, it became apparent that things had changed, and it was now only going to be a Pathfinder tank with a new prototype, BN 2.1, speculated to be the actual first Super Heavy. However, it's looking like BN 2.1 is also a Pathfinder tank, and it, along with BN 2, are now in the process of being scrapped. BN3 then will be the first Super Heavy, provided of course that we don't count BN1, and I don't think we should since this was always just a manufacturing prototype. So far, it's still looking like BN3 will be paired with SN20 to be the first orbital test vehicle of the full Starship system. The flight will see Super Heavy burn for 170 seconds before staging away and performing a partial burn back to land before soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico. Starship SN20 will then continue on to orbit before performing a powered landing and soft touchdown just off 
off the coast of Hawaii. From there, we expect subsequent Starship and Super Heavy prototypes to be paired up in a similar fashion, SN21 with BN4, SN22 with BN5, SN23 with BN6. After this, the next major design upgrade will come with BN7 and SN24, a bit like how SN15 was the first major upgrade following the vehicles SN8, 9, 10 and 11. What these changes will be though is anyone's guess really, and we still don't really know what all of the changes made from the SN8 to 15 were, aside from visual ones, and presumably SpaceX want to keep most of these changes confidential. Work continues on the rest of Starbase, with orbital launch pad construction still plowing on and work on the ground support systems remaining a constant operation. However, in addition to the business as usual stuff, we also saw the unveiling of a big Starbase sign outside of the rocket farm, christening the site with a far catchier name than SpaceX's facility in Boca Chica. It lights up beautifully at night as well. Anyway, I'm going to cap off my Starship coverage there. As with last week, a lot of little things going on with major news surrounding SN1516 and BN3 hopefully right around the corner. Hopefully we'll hear more in the coming days. Anyway, with Starship coverage wrapped, let's see what else took place last week. On the 18th of May, we saw an Atlas V rocket launch from Cape Canaveral. Atlas V is one of the major launch vehicles used by NASA and the workhorse of the United Launch Alliance fleet. Not only was the mission a success, the 86th fully successful mission for the rocket, but we also got some fantastic shots from the ground of the liftoff sequence on ULA's video coverage. On board was a missile warning satellite for the United States Space Force, which was deployed to geosynchronous Earth orbit. There were two additional secondary payloads, both of which were CubeSats designed for technology demonstration on behalf of the US Air Force Academy. Both were deployed into a highly elliptical Earth orbit. The day after Atlas V, China launched a Long March 4B from the Jiuquan Launch Complex, which carried a Haiyang 2D oceanography satellite to low Earth orbit on behalf of the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources. Orbital rocket launches aside, we also got to see some suborbital flights. The sounding rockets Black Brand 12A and Black Brand 9 both launched on the 17th and 18th of May, respectively. The Black Brand 12A carried a plasma science experiment for the University of Alaska Fairbanks, while the Black Brand 9 carried a solar observation spectrograph for the Goddard Space Flight Center to an apogee of 335.4 kilometers. Perhaps the most significant suborbital flight last week was the May 22nd successful space flight of Virgin Galactic's VSS. Unity, which was the first human spaceflight launched from the state of New Mexico. The purpose of the flight was to test the upgraded flight control systems of the VSS Unity spaceplane, carry some technology experiments for NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, and, of course, to prove the vehicle's ability to fly to space and return. Piloted by CJ Sturco and Davy McKay, VSS Unity detached from the mothership VMS Eve at an altitude of 44,000 feet. After clearing the mothership, its rocket engine was ignited which propelled the spacecraft to 90.23 kilometers, exposing its inhabitants to more than two minutes of microgravity before coasting back down to its launch site, Spaceport America, bringing a successful end to this landmark mission for Virgin Galactic, a giant leap forward toward the opening of commercial space travel. Hopefully a bit of competition for Blue Origin's tourist flights will help drive down the price. Oof, that's... That's one expensive seat up for bidding right now. <laughs> On the 17th of May, Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck shared this photo of the Electron first stage from their recent Running Out of Toes mission. We covered this launch in last week's episode where the ascent went well, but an anomaly in second stage ignition caused a loss of telemetry, resulting in mission failure. However, this mission also happens to be Rocket Lab's second attempt at recovering their first stage, which, from the looks of things, went well, putting a nice, as Peter Beck puts it, silver lining to the mission. Hopefully, Rocket Lab managed to pinpoint the cause of the upper stage failure, as well as gather useful data from the recovered first stage on their quest to make Electron a partially reusable launch system. Yesterday, the 23rd of May, we were expecting to see a Terrier-improved Malamute sounding rocket carry an experimental payload from the S-Range Space center in Sweden, but so far no news on if this went ahead has released and I gotta draw the line somewhere when editing these video guys so if you're interested you can always do a bit of googling for this one, but whether it launched or not it's still the final thing I wanted to mention for this segment, wrapping up my coverage of all the major events that happened last week. And if you're enjoying what you've seen so far then please do like the video down below. I know it's cheesy to ask but I gotta do it in order to keep my channel alive and it's always very much appreciated. Anyway, with last week summarized, let's look ahead to what to expect over the next seven days. 
On the 26th of May, SpaceX will launch Starlink L28, their latest Starlink launch, which will once again be a Falcon 9 carrying 60 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit. The first stage will land 620 kilometers downrange on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. This Starlink launch is fairly significant, as with its conclusion, the first Starlink shell will be completed. SpaceX plan to have five shells for phase one of Starlink. You can always think of these shells as being like sub constellations, each one being at a different altitude inclination and consisting of a different number of satellites in order to maximize coverage of the network on Earth. With completion of Shell 1, which consists of 72 orbital planes with 22 satellites in each, about 80% of the Earth's surface is now covered. The day after Starlink, on the 27th of May, we'll see another communication satellite launch. This time it'll be the next 36 satellites for the OneWeb constellation, which will once again be launching from a Soyuz 2.1, operated by Ariane Space and StarSem, and launched from the Vostok Cosmodrome. Always fun seeing the Soyuz launch, especially from the Stockney. I don't know, there's something so cool about the shiny new buildings and clean blue launch clamps compared with the aging desert appearance of Baikonur, which of course the Stockney was built to lessen Russia's reliance on, given that Baikonur isn't actually in Russia since it was built before the collapse of the Soviet Union. After Soyuz, we'll see another launch from China. This time it'll be a Long March 7, launching from the Wenchang Launch Complex on the 29th of May. This will be the Tianzhou 2, the first cargo flight to the Chinese space station, which was launched just last month, as regular viewers of Space This Week will know. At present, it's not clear yet if this cargo vessel will remain attached to the station for the duration of the first crewed mission to the station, Shenzhou 12, given that it is a possibility, as the space station as it stands has more than one docking port, as opposed to China's previous space stations. Time will tell, I suppose. The next day, on the 30th of May, China will launch another rocket, this time a Long March 3BE, which will launch a Feng Yang 4B meteorology satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit from the Zichang Launch Complex on behalf of the China Meteorological Administration. This week will also have a suborbital flight, this will be on the 27th of May, and will be the sounding rocket Terrier Improved Malamute, which will launch an ionospheric propagation payload to space on behalf of the University of Berkeley. And that's it for what to expect to see launch launching Skyward this week, so now it's time to delve into our final segment, all the most interesting historic anniversaries set to take place over the upcoming seven days. The first anniversary of the week takes place today, the 24th of May, when in 1962 American astronaut Scott Carpenter orbited the Earth three times in the Aurora 7 space capsule, the fourth crewed flight of Project Mercury. Due to a series of malfunctions, the capsule landed 250 miles downrange from its intended splashdown point, but luckily both Carpenter and the capsule were retrieved. Tomorrow, the 25th of May, will mark the 1966 anniversary of the launch of Explorer 32. Launched aboard a Delta C-1 rocket, Explorer 32 was a satellite for the United States to study the Earth's upper atmosphere. While the satellite had an operational life of 10 months, the two neutral mass spectrometers failed a few days after the launch, though luckily the remaining scientific instruments operated well for most of the satellite's lifetime. The mission would come to an end when the satellite suffered a depressurization in its vacuum sealed stainless steel body, which caused battery failure, which of course then left the satellite dead. Its orbit eventually decayed, and it re-entered the atmosphere in February 1985. Also on the 25th of May, this time in 2008, NASA's Phoenix lander touched down in the Green Valley region of Mars's Arctic to search for environmental characteristics that would support water and microbial life. The spacecraft was expected to operate for 90 Martian days, though the Phoenix lasted about two months further than this, before succumbing to the cold and dark of the Martian winter. The mission was nonetheless considered a success as it had fulfilled all of its scientific objectives. The final anniversary for the 25th of May is the 2012 rendezvous and birth of the SpaceX Dragon with the International Space Station. Dragon was the first commercial spacecraft to perform such a rendezvous and birth with the station, and of course the spacecraft, or at least a newer version of it, remains in service today, both as a cargo vessel and now with a crew variant too, though We'll talk about the latter a little bit later on in this segment. On the 26th of May in 1969, Apollo 10 returned to Earth after eight days in space, serving as a full dress rehearsal of the Apollo components ahead of the first moon landing. Now, we talked a lot about Apollo 10 last week, so I'll leave the coverage of this mission there. On the 30th of May in 1971, Mariner 9 was launched. This was a probe operated by NASA, which would head on to Mars and become the first ever spacecraft to orbit another planet. The probe contributed 
contributed enormously to the exploration of Mars and sent back 7,329 images over the course of its mission, which concluded in October 1972 after the craft depleted its supply of attitude control gas. It remains in Mars orbit to this day, but it's expected to deorbit fairly soon from around 2022 due to orbital decay. The third and final anniversary for the 30th of May is a fairly recent one. In 2020, the Crew Dragon Demo 2 launched from the Kennedy Space Center, becoming the first crewed orbital spacecraft to launch from the United States since the final shuttle mission in 2011. Wow, has it been a year since that launch happened? My goodness, it feels like yesterday. It carried NASA astronauts Douglas Hurley and Robert Benkin to the International Space Station and was a test flight of the Dragon capsule intended to validate its systems and to receive human rating certification. The mission was a success, and the two astronauts splashed down in August 2020 in the first water landing by astronauts since 1975. The capsule would go on to be refurbished by SpaceX and reflown on the Crew 2 mission that launched just last month on the 23rd of April 2021. And that's it. There were quite a lot of anniversaries this week, hence why I had to be fairly economical with how much I could talk about each one, but they'll be fun to reminisce nonetheless when their days roll along. Anyway, Anyway, let's close up there. And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. We covered a lot, not just in the coverage of last week and this week, but also through the pages of history. I didn't even include all of the anniversaries that took place this week, such as the 1999 first dock to the ISS of Space Shuttle Discovery, or even the 240 BC first perihelion of Halley's Comet. But We've got to make some cuts here and there for the sake of time budgeting. It is going to be interesting though, what happens later this year when we hit the one year anniversary of space this week and have therefore done every historic anniversary. Should I just keep the segment unchanged since we'll have probably forgotten the previous year's recap of anniversaries by then? Or should I change it up? Maybe just do one anniversary that I think is the most important of the week and cover it in a lot more depth than I do in the current format. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this in the comments down below, but before you scroll down and make those comments, I must ask you to bear witness to the magnificent names scrolling on the left, all my Patreon supporters. If you want to be listed there, then you can join via the description link or via the on-screen card, and of course consider subscribing subscribing or even joining my channel to get these videos sent directly to your feed. Sometimes, possibly, maybe, who even knows anymore with YouTube notifications. Also on screen are two videos. One is my most recent upload. One is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. I hope you enjoy it. And that's it. I bid thee goodbye. I don't know. <laughs>